Hey y'all, it's your girl Phoenix from the Streets Radio and we are on the rise once more. We've got this morning with us one of the most prominent characters, actors who will be presenting his story in Fades and Fellowship this weekend at the Motor House located at dot 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 East North Avenue because again, I'm not good with addresses. So I present to you ladies and gentlemen, the barber of one of our country's most revolutionary activist, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mr. Nelson Malden. I really love the fact that your name itself, like if I were to like kind of transpose some of those letters and add an A, gives us that other re revolutionary, right? Nelson Mandela. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm thinking about all of this yeah. stuff. So <laughs> tell me how you came to be Dr. King's barber. Well, in 1954, I was the youngest barber at this particular barber shop. And so I also was a student at Alabama State College. The college is about one block from the barber shop. So I had a class at 10 o'clock that morning, and I would never like to cut another head after 20 minutes to the hour. So by 9 30, I saw this blue pointer head pull up in front of the barber shop. I would spend all my money the night before, so I needed the money. So I would never like to cut another head after 20 minutes to the hour. And I looked at this little man when he got out of the car. I looked at his head. I saw, heck, I can knock him out in 15 minutes. So he came in the shop. I asked him what was his name. He said, Martin Luther King. I said, where are you from? He said, Atlanta, Georgia. I said, what are you doing in town? He said, I'm here to preach my trial sermon at Dexter. I said, oh, that's my church. He said, good to meet you. So after I finished cutting his hair, I gave him the mirror to say, I like this haircut. And he told me, pretty good. So you know, you tell a barber, pretty good. That's kind of an insult. But he came back two weeks later, he waited on me. I was busy, the other barber was vacant, so I told him that I must have been a pretty good haircut. He said, you all right. So we always had some lot of sarcastic going on between the two of us, but he always was come out on top. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that very the first time, that's the very first day I met, but that was in 1954. 1954, wow. And here it is, 2016, and you are telling your story. So, like, how did that feel? Like, was that an honor for you at the time? Because you had no idea who he was. I had no idea who he was. He was very unknown. And at the shop I was working in at that time, we, we was cutting one of the leading barber shops in Montgomery. And I was cutting most of the leading black preacher's hair, so he was just a little bit of a boy. And I mean, you know, I had no real recognition of who he was. He had no idea I would be cutting one of the most historical figures of the 20th century because that's how we basically got started. And here he was, ready to come and preach at your church. In Dexter Bat, yeah, I, was, I joined the church and they preached there before uh, uh, Reverend Kane. His name was Runner John. And basically how Kane got the job is because Runner John had to get rid of him because he was a very uh, hard person to deal with as a minister. So when the Reverend when Mr. Nez goes to Atlanta to interview for his cutting it, the, the minute the manager there just by making small talk said, How's your church? And that's when the manager said, he's my Mr. Nez told him, Well, we don't have a pastor now. He said, Oh, why would you call this young boy? He's home from school for the weekend and he might consider. So that's when he called my little came 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 to Montgomery something about it he liked and he stayed there for six years until he left in nineteen sixty. And you stayed there as a member of that congregation until? I stayed to the church until, you know, I, uh, for a whole while, you know. He left in 1960, but he came back many times after he left, you know, because he had a lot of friends still left in Montgomery. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you said that you were actually, like, cutting hair for a lot of big-name preachers down in that area at the time. Were any of those guys, like, you know, did they measure up? Were they, like, on the same level as Martin Luther King? And well, none of them. See, when Reverend King came to Montgomery, he was still working on his dissertation at Boston Theological Seminary, so very few people could be in the same category with him mm -hmm. from an intellectual point of view. See, he, was, he had his Ph.D., he was working on his PhD, but I was cutting also Reverend Abernacles hair, which was one of Reverend King's assistants. I was cutting Father the Bowles hair, I was cutting Father Lewis. So basically, I was cutting the barber shop I was in by luck when I came to Montgomery in 1952. Which just so happened this was one of the most established barber shops in Montgomery. I didn't have any money to go to college, but I could work my way through college by working, going to the barber shop at 8 o'clock in the morning, go to private class at 9. So in between, I go back and forth because the barber shop was just one block from Alabama State Campus. So I had no idea about what was going on at the time. He stayed there for a whole year before he got to be famous. So he came in 54. He didn't get to be famous until December the 5th. 
Now, something mm. happens when somebody sits in the barber chair and somehow or another, there actually is a therapy session that takes place between a barber and his client. And one of the things that I want to know is, what was he saying to you about his life and his ambition and his expectations of people at that time? Well, he lived, Reverend King lived a half a block from the barbershop, so he spent a lot of time in the barbershop. So we had a lot of conversations because most times when he was come in, uh, he didn't want a haircut, he would take a seat in the back of the barbershop. And so one day he was in there and two old men were sitting beside him and one of those men started coughing. The other man said, hey man, what are you taking for your cold? He said, I'm taking aspirin and orange juice. The other man said, man, the best thing for your cold is take your handkerchief, put you some ice cream salt in it, put you some Tim Time and put it on your chest. I guarantee your cold will be gone the next morning. So there are two students up in front of the shop. One had got a ticket for doing 40 miles an hour in the 30 mile zone. The other student said, man, you got to learn how to talk to you white folks in Alabama. So you ran and said yes and no. If you'd have said yes sir, and no, so you wouldn't have got that ticket. So the two old men left and the two students left and the other two barbers went to lunch and when I finished my last cusp, he left. So just the two of us in the shop, he said, Barber, you know what? I said, what's that, Rev? I learned more in this barber shop today than I've ever learned in my life. I said, what's that? He said, barber shop medicine will get you in a cemetery and barber shop law will get you in prison. I was always trying to come around Thinking of the words you're saving now Think I'm ready to make you my baby now I don't even care how you don't cause you So much I can answer around in front of you You don't know what's right in front of you And you Lay the cards out in front of you Just wanna make it comfortable Like nobody ever did before So you and me, we got history You don't know how much you meant to me Take a puff, it comes in with me If I live true We can go higher, baby